morning, everyone. We stand with us now. We prepare our hearts for this time of worship, coming into the throne room of our Heavenly Father. We come before Him, offering Him our praise. What? 
he's gonna do next. Are you ready? Are you ready or not? All right, you may be seated. Good morning. Okay, we'll do it again. You may be seated. Good morning. Okay, we'll do it again. Good morning. All right, did the new chairs throw you? Is that what it is? We don't know how to worship in new chairs. I hear you worship fantastic in these chairs, and we've already seen a glimpse of that this morning. Uh, I'm Michael Cloud. I'm the associate pastor at Trinity here in Ruston. Thanks for joining us in person and online this morning. Uh, Let's look at our bulletin for our announcements. You see a little, uh, we called it the stub at our old church. You call it the flap here. Uh, but look at the, the stub flap thing on the side of your bulletin. Uh, if you're uh, joining us this morning, welcome. Uh, put your name here, rip that off, put it in the offering baskets as those go by later in the service so we can bug you sometime later this week. Uh, and if it's not your first time, still fill this out and let us know that you were here because uh, I'll forget. I'm sorry. That's just the way my brain works. Uh, but as far as announcements, you'll see uh, a message there about our discernment team uh, that has been recently uh, formed and is going to get going here any day now. And so if you have any questions uh, about that, you can direct it to Doug or I or, uh, more importantly, uh, to these team members here. Uh, and then we have got a hymn sing on September 11th at 5 p.m. in the Burkhalter Chapel. Y'all come and join us for that. Uh, I hear we have to do Doug's favorite hymn first, and then you get to pick uh, after that what, what's going on. And then there is just a slew of Bible studies for all ages uh, happening all around Trinity. And so uh, get engaged uh, at every level, whatever level you're at, children, youth, adult, uh, whole family. Y'all come and be a part of the life of the church. Okay. Anything else on announcements? All right. I didn't miss anything there. Let's take this time to go to God in prayer. And let me just say real quick before we do that, normally we would tell you to, to empty your minds, get rid of all of the distractions. I want you to hold on to those uh, for just a second. Let's pray. Mighty God, we ask that you come into our hearts and our minds that are full of everything that's going on in our lives, all the, the fears and the anxieties and the worries, all the joys and the blessings that we're trying to find an outlet for and we don't know what to do with, come in to where we are, to what's going on, the things in our lives that are happening most evidently and most secretly. Give us the spirit of discernment to see you in the bad times. The spirit of discernment that sees you in the good times. And Father God, we pray ever so earnestly and desperately for that spirit of yours that testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, that we have that assurance and Father God, we pray that you would give us the boldness to claim that inheritance and to go out with boldness to all of those who are children of God, that they too may taste and see that the Lord is good, that they too may know the joy that you have given and the strength that you give us in our times of need. Lord, when our words fall short, we pray as your Son taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, at this time, we would like to ask Karen to come up, and we are going to do uh, the giving of the third grade Bibles. So if you are a third grader, also come up uh, with Karen here. 
We're going to give the, the third grade Bibles. I found something interesting this morning. Uh, this sets in my car. This is my car Bible. But it's not just my car Bible. It is my third grade Bible given to me on September 17th, 1995 from Trinity United Methodist Church. So whatever the math is there, this is that old. Uh, and somebody this morning, they said, oh, you found your third grade Bible. I said, no, sir, I never lost it. So we're giving you these third grade Bibles. Uh, read them, talk about them in your Sunday school classes and with your parents. And Doug will talk about this a little later in the sermon. There's a lot of confusing stuff in here, uh, even for adults, uh, but that's okay, because uh, that's what we're here for. That's what the, the body is here for. That's what the church is here for, uh, to figure this thing out together. Let's pray. Oh God, we ask that you come upon these children and the Bibles that they have received, that you would be with them, that you would give them a spirit of curiosity and spirit of knowledge to know the deeper things about you, that you would put great and deep questions in our hearts and that you would give them the eyes uh, to find what they are looking for in your word. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Church, we stand with me now as we sing this old hymn together. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow.
That is right. Yeah, we can be excited about that, about the blood of our Lord and Savior. Because we were dead in our sin, because we were filthy in it, and we dip our robes in the blood of the Lamb, and they come back white as snow. No matter what you have done, no matter where you are this morning, you may be even thinking, if you're watching at home or whatever, you may be thinking, I, God cannot possibly love me after what I've done. And I'm here to tell you that is a lie. Because he made each one of us. He crafts us with his very hands. He knows every hair on our head. He knew us before we were born, when we were still in our mother's womb. He knew that we would stumble and fall. And yet he gave us a way to come back to him through the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's because of that blood, because of the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross, that we are made righteous, that we are called into the family of God and that we will be with him forever and eternity. I cannot even begin to understand that love, to wrap my mind around it. But that's what he shows us each and every day. He gives us breath, he gives us life. So let's continue worshiping him for the love that he first showed us. Like a covenant of old, your love is enduring and through the winter rain and beyond the horizon with mercy for today.
be seated. We're at that time in the service where we remember that all the gifts and talents that we have have been given to us by God, and so it's only right to give back out of what we have been given. The ushers will be passing around uh, baskets for the offering, and you're uh, always welcome to come up uh, to the altar and place your offerings and your gifts in these baskets as well. Would you pray with me? Our God, we ask that you would receive this offering and that you would bless it and that you would teach us how to use it to further your kingdom.
Still in the eighth chapter of the book of Romans, we have this week and next week. This week our lesson comes, starts in the 26th verse of that chapter. Hear these words. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, in order that He might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom He predestined, He also called. And those whom He called, He also justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. Friends, this is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. This um, story works with your favorite football coaches, whoever you want to tell it on. It works with your favorite group of politicians, whoever you want to tell it on. Or it works like this. A preacher, a rabbi, and a priest... We're all out fishing in the middle of the lake. The priest tells his two colleagues, I left my fishing rod in the car. I'll be right back. He gets out of the boat, walks across the water to the beach, goes to his car, walks back across the lake, gets into the boat. And the rabbi just stares in amazement. The preacher We'll make him a Methodist preacher. The Methodist preacher, about 30 minutes later, says, you know, my dermatologist has been all over me about my sunblock, and I forgot it in the car. I need to go get my lotion so my dermatologist won't be mad at me. Jumps out of the boat, walks to his car, gets out his prescription sunblock, walks back across the lake, gets in the boat. The rabbi is just speechless. He is watching all this goes on, and he thinks, you know, my faith is deep. I think I can do this too. So he says to his colleagues in the boat, I need to go get something to drink, and there's a a drink stand right over there. I'll be right back. And he stands up, puts his feet on the water, and splash, goes straight down in the water. The priest and the Methodist minister reach down. They grab him pull him back up into the boat, and he's embarrassed. He's also wet, but he knows he can do it if the others two can. So he stands up again, steps out in the water, and splash. Again, he's drugged back up into the boat and thinking, surely I can do this. As he's going down for a third time, the priest turns to the Methodist minister and asks, Do you think we should show him where the stumps are? (laughs) Yeah, it's one of those, but you'll get it later on. Giving Bibles to third graders is showing them where the stumps are. And showing them how to be faithful witnesses of Jesus Christ and how to live a life that's pleasing to God how to live out the words of this book. And as Michael challenged them, and I say to the third graders again, you know, there are some passages of Scripture you're going to need help interpreting. And that's why there are Sunday school teachers and youth groups and small groups. And I hope that um, you, if you're struggling with Scripture, if there's a, a verse that's buffaloed you, that you'll get some help, that you'll call. Michael and I love talking about the Bible, that you'd ask a teacher or a leader or somebody in your small group, and it's okay to say, I'm struggling with this passage. We give Bibles to third graders because, in a sense, we're inviting them into community. 
We're inviting them into relationships with people who can be their mentors and guides, people who will point them faithfully to Jesus Christ because, you know, there are just some places in here if you quote it wrong or if you misquote it, it does harm. In April of 1974, there was a tornado, tornado outbreak in the central and southern part of the United States. When you look at the map of the uh, tornadoes, a lot of them were focused in North Alabama. And in this small town called Guin, I'm going to get it right this service, called Guin, about 5.30 in the afternoon, an F5 tornado, which is the most powerful tornado, went through the town. And Guin didn't have a lot to begin with. And the tornado pretty much picked it clean. Almost every building in town was destroyed. So the people of North Alabama do what they do during tornadoes. They sent um, the rescue workers in, the police, the state troopers, the firemen. They all descended on this little town where an F5 tornado had come through. And they started their work of rescue about seven o'clock that same night a second f5 tornado following almost exactly the same path as the first one went through guin alabama hit with two f5 tornadoes in under three hours there was nothing left Lives were lost. Lives of rescuers were lost. And of course, here come the television stations, and this was back in the 70s before videotape. You actually had to film it. And the people descended and they filmed it. And a couple of days later, you got to watch it on the TV news. And I remember there was a... A man, they were asking him about it, and he explained that, you know, the first one got his barn, and the second one got he and his, his house and animals. I actually think maybe a family member or two. And he had one of those Bibles, and I don't know if this has ever happened to your Bible, but if, if they get windblown or if the pages get wet, for some reason, Bibles get fluffy. They just get, and he was holding this fluffy Bible that wouldn't close as they were interviewing them, interviewing him. And he said, but it's terrible and it's horrible what's happened. But you know, the good book says, the good book says that everything's going to work out okay. Okay. Except the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible never gets close to saying that. And what happens when someone, well-intentioned, I'm sure, traumatized definitely, but when someone says that, people immediately start making the extension. So what you're saying is everything is good. Child abuse is not good. Murder is not good. Tornadoes that kill people, not good. Hurricanes that wipe out communities, not good. Personal trauma and tragedy, not good. And over the years, I've listened to these people, and, and so many of them were being interviewed after something just horrible had happened, and they feel the need to quote parts of Romans 8, 28, either correctly or incorrectly, as though they are trying to convince themselves and God that definitely you will fix this. Or they're capitulating to the divine. I have to say it's good, although in my heart I don't believe it's good. So I want to say to people who are on television doing this, step away from the verse, back up. And I want to say to you, if you ever are for forced to 
Forced is a good word because none of us want to do it. But if you ever find yourself in the midst of a tragedy trying to comfort someone or trying to make them feel better or trying to be there with them when they are hurting, do not, quote Romans 8, 28, step back from the verse, people. Step back. It doesn't say God's going to work everything out. What it does say is powerful and majestic and encouraging. And I was trying to figure out, okay, how am I going to teach Romans 8, 28 to the congregation? So you're going to get a Greek lesson today. I've been waiting 37 years to give a Greek lesson to a group of Methodists in the congregation. You're going to get one. Hang on. The problem with Romans 8.28 is it suffers from something that is called syntactic ambiguity. Syntactic ambiguity. I will illustrate. Here is a sentence for you. All you English people are going, good, he's going to give us a sentence. If you want to diagram this, feel free to diagram it in your seats. Here's your sentence. John saw the man on a mountain with a telescope. Syntactic ambiguity. John saw the man on a mountain with a telescope. All we know of that verse is there are at least two people in it, John and a man. And there's a mountain in it, and there's a telescope. We don't know who's got the telescope. We don't know if anybody's looking through the telescope or the telescope's been seen. We don't have any other information other than John and a man and a mountain and a telescope. And you can put the verse together or that sentence together any way you want to, and you'd be correct. Romans 8.28 suffers from syntactic ambiguity. That unless you happen to read Greek, it confuses you. So I'm going to translate it, literally. Paul says this, first two words, we know now. We know now. We know because we've seen it. We know because we've experienced it. This is not some intuition we are having. We have experiential we have epistemological evidence that this has happened. We see our brothers and sisters hurting. We see what the Roman Empire is starting to do to the church. We know what the Jews have been doing to the church. We have seen God deliver people from heartache and pain. We have also seen our brothers and sisters in Christ suffer the ultimate through the persecution of the Romans. We know it because we have seen it. It's not a faith statement. We have this experience. And what, what the translators do next is they leave a conjunction out. The conjunction is there in the Greek language. It is just not translated in most American translations. And the word is now. We know now. What that implies is their knowledge base has grown. And I want to say that what Paul is referring back to is the first part of the text I read this morning, that likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God who searches the heart knows what is in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know now that God is going to carry us through whatever we're going to go through because we are no longer children who walk in the flesh who cannot please God because we're walking in the flesh, but we are now filled with the Spirit of God. We become children of God. We put on our God shoes. Have I reminded you of every sermon I've preached in the sermon series thus far? Yes, I have. Now we're different. Now we've got God on our side. 
Now we've got the Holy Spirit praying for us, praying and leading us as we pray to God and ask God to help us through this very difficult time of whatever we're going through. Now we know that for those loving God, Romans 8, 28 doesn't belong to the world. world. It belongs to the church. It belongs to the people of God. It applies to the people of God. It applies to those who love God. That is such a rare term used in Scripture, talking about people loving God. It's usually the other way around. We got God loving us. But people who love God, these are the storytellers of the faith. These are the ones who have lived out the story of blessing. They know what it means to have God transform their life. They know what it means to go through the storms. They know what it means to have God's protection. They know what it means to have God's sustaining power. And if you hang around long enough, they will tell you what it is like to love God. They will share a story of faith. They will share a story of perseverance. They will share a story of never giving up despite insurmountable odds and great difficulty. Now we know, now we know for those loving God, here you go, Here's what the phrase says in Greek. That God works together the whole toward good. God works together the whole toward good. Greek word is panta. The root word is pas. You can translate it the whole. You can, if it has an article in front of it, it's all things. It can be translated correctly everything. But I translated it the whole because Romans 8.28 is not talking about individual events. It's talking about the whole, the totality of your life. I survived the super outbreak of 1974. Yes, there were tornadoes that went through Decatur, Alabama. I survived the Arcadia tornado of 1992. I didn't know Bill Clinton had been elected president for three or four days. Um, I sat in downtown Lake Charles during Hurricane Rita. Those are just weather things. But I made it through Panta, the whole. Well, I've also been a dad, a granddad. I've got to pastor great people called Methodist and watch churches revive and watch the Holy Spirit get active in people's lives. The totality of my life is not measured by tragedy. It's measured by the whole, panta. And God is working this whole. God is working this whole, all the events of our lives, toward the good. And that's exactly what the Greek says, toward. It points in the direction of the good. Interesting thing about that Greek word good, it is used implying a personal relationship with God and Christ, and the good is always a gift from God. That must be good. If God's going to give you something good, it must be a good gift, and everything we know is good from God, right? The book of Genesis ends with the story of a baby boy. His name is Joseph. And 
If you want to get caught up in one of our staff's great theological debates, come to the office and choose sides because some people believe on the staff that Joseph is a hero of the faith. There's some of us that believe he's just a spoiled little brat that, you know, he pretty much gets what he deserves until God sort of straightens him out a little bit. But Joseph, yes, he's the one that has the dreams that I'm going to be the... You know, I have a dream of my brothers bowing down to me, and his daddy gives him the Technicolor dream coat, and they write a Broadway musical about him. And he's just obnoxious. And he's the kind of little brother that he's always ratting out his bigger brothers. And the bigger brothers have had the little brat about up to here. And so they said, we're going to get rid of him. And they do what big brothers do with bratty little brothers. They threw him in a pit. Uh, Got rid of him. And the Midianites come by and they scoop him up out of the pit and they haul him down to Egypt. And he grows up and becomes a pool boy at Potiphar's house. And you know that story. And he gets thrown in jail because of that incident. And he's in the jail and he has the dream and and he's telling people what the dreams mean and nobody will remember him. And suddenly Pharaoh catches Joseph and Joseph becomes second in command in Egypt. And there's a famine. And the people in Palestine have to go down to Egypt to get their grain And Joseph, now a grown man, recognizes his brothers. And then the brothers recognize him. What's going to happen? The brothers are scared to death. And Joseph says this to them. Brothers, even though you intended to do me harm, what God intended it for good. How in the world can getting thrown into a pit and getting thrown into jail end up being good? because those are in the intentions of God. That's what God wanted to have happen. That's what Paul is saying here, that God works the whole. God works all of the events of our lives out toward good, toward his plan, and he gets even more specific. For those who, toward his purpose, are being called... God doesn't work it out for good because he has to. He works it out for good because we're called as his children to live a life that glorifies him. So I'm going to put it all back together. We know now that for those who love God, God works together the whole toward good. For those who, toward his purpose, are being called. That says a whole lot better than the good book says everything's going to work out. This says that God is active in my life. This says that God is active in the activities that surround my life. This says that part of my deal as a Christian is to spend a lot of time on my knees trying to figure out and hear and be obedient to what God wants me to do or what God's trying to do in my life. It means that sometimes I stub my toe because that's the will of God because God knew I should have been walking around the house in my God shoes rather than sinner barefooted. Do you trust God 
with the events and the activities in your life? Do you trust God enough to say, God, I, I, I don't see the good right now, but I have to lean on you and I have to trust you and I have to believe you and I do trust you and believe you and lean on you that you're going to work the whole. And the whole God means for good. He doesn't calm all the storms. Not everything we do is going to work out. I believe the great theologian Lynn Anderson said, I never promised you a rose garden. But God is on his throne and God is in charge and you are participants in the kingdom of God as a child of God. God's working the whole toward good. There are a lot of ways I could have handled this. I thought about preaching a sermon on suffering and, and if... You know, we get hung up in why do bad things happen to good people and, and, and why do, I want to know why good things happen to bad people. Why does stuff happen? And the Bible tells us, have faith. Keep walking with God because God's not finished with your journey. All three Gospels, um, excuse me, all four Gospels tell the story of Jesus walking on the water. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke have Jesus coming and walking on the water late at night and the storm comes up and, and the disciples are scared and, and Jesus gets into the boat and Jesus says to the storm, peace, be still. Storm calms and, and the disciples fall on their feet and fall on their knees and worship Jesus. The Gospel of John, which is written later than Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's written in a time where the Christians are being persecuted not only by the Jews but by the Romans. It's a hard time to be a Christian when John writes his Gospel. Here's how John tells the story. When the evening came, his disciples went down to the sea and got into a boat and started to cross the sea to Capernaum. Now it was dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because of a strong wind that was blowing. And when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But Jesus said to them, It's I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. No mention of calming the storm. But the boat reached the destination. God does not calm all storms, but your boat will always reach the destination. That hole, that panta, the hole God is working on toward good. Some of you just need to keep hanging in there and we're here to hang in there with you. Some of you have reached the end of your rope and you need to come running and let the church love on you and hold faith for you while you can't hold it for yourself right now. Some of us need to admit we just can't keep doing it by ourselves. We need help. This is a place where God's love and grace is available to you, where whatever you need, if it's humanly or divinely possible, we're going to give it to you in the name of Christ. And I promise on behalf of myself and the Methodists sitting in this room that if your life's falling apart, 
we are not going to quote Romans 8, 28 to you. We're just going to wrap our arms around you and love you and pray for you and lift you up. Sometimes you need to step away from the verse. Would you stand and pray with me? For those times when life is hard, oh God, we pray that we would keep our eyes on you in the midst of the storms, in the midst of brokenness. Help us to find your love and grace here in your church, through the ministry of others, or through the wonderful serendipitous power of the Holy Spirit. We trust you, Lord, in the good days. We trust you more in the hard days. Be with us as we journey together in Jesus' name. Amen.
Okay, we need your help after the worship service. You're going to love this one. We're going to have the floor people in here tomorrow stripping and waxing the floors. So, <clears throat> oh, please, oh, please, oh, please, will you help us put the chairs up on the stage? And anything else that's on the floor needs to either be up on the stage or out in the hallways so they can do the floors in here. I just knew you were looking forward to a way of serving the church. So if you could help, we would be greatly appreciative. Otherwise, receive this benediction. And now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and abide with you always. Amen.